This conference will now be recorded. Okay, so uh, we'll start with a new chapter today that's in design obstruction. And uh, first of all, just a few acknowledgements uh, that I have taken liberty in this lecture, lifted uh, photographs and pictures from the net and shorts and other textbooks. First, let's talk about the classification. There are a number of terms you will come across when you're talking about obstruction, uh, intestinal obstruction. Uh, number one, dynamic, adynamic. The other could be acute, subacute, chronic. The third method of describing intestinal obstruction could be a partial or a total, where you're talking about where there's a partial block of the lumen or there's a total uh, block of the lumen. Number three, uh, number four could be a strangulated and non-strangulated type of uh, intestinal obstruction, where we are talking about the uh, vascular compromise in a patient with acute intestinal obstruction, the bowel segment, there's a vascular compromise in that particular segment. And then, of course, a term that is known as pseudo obstruction, which is also a part of the adynamic obstruction. So we'll talk about these when we, as you go forward in the lecture. If you look incidence wise, uh, that's the incidence wise, if you look at the cause of uh, obstruction, and one thing which clearly stands out is that the most common cause of obstruction as of today is adhesions, anywhere between 40 to 65 percent. Uh, the figures vary, but it is around 40 to 65 percent of uh, small bowel obstructions are because of uh, adhesions. Uh, the second in line could be carcinoma, inflammatory, then you got obstructed hernias, the fecal impaction, and then the pseudo obstruction, which also plays a, a significant role in 5 percent of cases. And then the rest 5 percent is all made up of miscellaneous uh, causes, like for example, the Crohn's disease, the post-radiation, intersusception, volvulus, Goldstone alias, and so on and so forth. Now, among all these, one thing which clearly stands out is that small bowel obstruction accounts for almost 12 to 16 percent of emergency surgical admissions. That means out of 100 patients who are admitted in a surgical ward, in the emergency surgical ward, 12 to 16 percent will be having a small bowel obstruction, and 20 percent of the emergency surgical procedures are basically for small bowel obstruction. They're just figures which were important and which I presented to you. Now, if you look at the classification, that was the incidence-wise classification. And now this is basically the classification anatomically. One, it could be a block in the lumen, other it could be a block in the in the wall, or there could be a pathology outside the wall. So on the luminal causes, what is very obvious, so you can have a fecal impaction, you can have a foreign body impacted there, you can have a gallstone, or you can have bezoars. Uh, intramural, you could have inflammatory pathology, like for example, a Crohn's disease, which gives rise to edematous bowel, leading to obstruction of the lumen. So that could be the intramural cause, or it could be a later on healing of a tubercular lesion leading to stricture formation, or you could have a malignant lesion, like for example, a lymphoma, or you could be having an interception right from ileal to colo to colocolic and so on and so forth. And then, of course, you could be having a volvulus either involving the cecum, the sigmoid, or the small bowel, which is the most common type of volvulus. <clears throat> if you look at the extramural causes, the common extramural causes have to do with bands, which could either be congenital, like, for example, the vitreo distinal duct band, or it could be an acquired, which is usually a post-operative or post-inflammatory. We'll talk about that uh, in the later slides. It could be adhesions, which is one of the most important causes I told you almost 40 to 60 percent i just now told you that 40 to 65 percent and these adhesions could be uh, because of acute inflammation it could be post-operative <clears throat> or it could be chronic adhesions because of a uh, past history of inflammatory episode and then uh, another important group are the hernias the external and the internal hernias now uh, that was the dynamic obstruction. This was the cause for dynamic obstruction. Now, talk about the adynamic obstruction. The two important causes number one is the pyelitic ileus, and number two is the pseudo obstruction. Now, coming to the pathophysiology, what really happens when you have an acute cell obstruction? Now, following a mechanical obstruction, wherever there's a block proximal to that block, the bowel initially shows an increased degree of peristaltic activity for the simple reason that it's trying to negotiate that particular block. So, it is it is basically increasing the force of contraction of the proximal part so that's able to negotiate that block number two more often than not it's not able to do that so what happens there is a vomiting 
and that vomiting is basically because of a backflow of the contents in the proximal bowel. Then there is a gradual reduction in the peristalsis. So initially they increase peristalsis until the bowel is fatigued. When it becomes fatigued, then the peristaltic activity slowly starts decreasing until it reach, reaches a stage of flaccidity, which is known as the ileus. And once that happens, once that happens, now the bowel starts distending. And that distension is a passive distension because of accumulated gas and accumulated fluids. Now, what about the gas? What gases are we talking about when we talk about the passive distension of the bowel? The major part of the gas, the two components to it. Number one is the swallowed air, and to a lesser degree, that which is produced in the industry. So, very simple. One, what you uh, swallow, and number two is what you're producing inside or what your intestines are producing. Now, approximately at all times, about 200 ml in, uh, uh, of gas is there in your, in your GI. And that is in the fasting and the postprandial states, around 200 ml. And in those subjects who complain of gaseous distension, even there, the complaint may be uh, uh, erroneous complaint because that could be a feeling of distension. But if you analyze the amount of gas there, it is usually around 200 ml. Now, the volume of the gas, how can you calculate? You said 200 ml of, of, uh, of gas inside your GI. So are there methods of uh, actually measuring it? Yes, if one, you can do a body plethysmography, you can do an argon washout technique, or you can use digitized abdominal radiographs. Now, digitized abdominal radiographs will give you an exact amount of volume of gas inside a GI. A plain radiograph can give you a, a approximate idea that, yes, this is a gaseous abdomen. Now, this I just told you so that you know this, but it's usually not used for the calcul calculation of volume of gas unless until you're going in for some kind of a research. Now, physiologically, this composition of gas, so you have gas, now we know of around 200 ml in the normal person, probably more in a, in a patient who's got a acute uh, cell obstruction. So what is it really made up of? Number one, it's got nitrogen, which is a predominant component, 90% of it. Then you've got oxygen with the minimal Y, because oxygen inside the air that you solve has already been absorbed by the enterocytes, that all the, the lining of the GI has gradually absorbed the oxygen. So it is minimal content of oxygen, carbon dioxide, why? Because that is now being shunted into the lumen from the cells, <clears throat> hydrogen, methane, and hydrogen sulfide. So these are the, the uh, contents in a physiological uh, scenario. Now, once there is obstruction because of growth of aerobic and anaerobic bacteria, both, both are going to grow. They are going to multiply in a, in a patient with obstruction. So that leads to excessive gas production. And after reabsorption of oxygen and carbon dioxide, the majority, 90%, and the rest is mainly hydrogen sulfide. So in an obstructed pattern, the, the pattern in an obstructed patient, the pattern changes from hydrogen and hydrogen sulfide, minimum amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide as compared to a physiological status of a patient where the nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide are the predominant components of the gas inside your inside your power. Now, the gas content and the gas qualitative content, they may vary across compartments of the GI. Like example, a stomach gas contains a high concentration of nitrogen and oxygen, similar to the atmosphere. Flatus contains less oxygen and more uh, methane. Now, that is basically because it is gradually being reabsorbed and methane is being produced. Now, none of the principal gases that you have have an odor, but your flatus always has an odor of varying degree. Now, what is the cause for the odor of the flatus? Number one, sulfur containing compounds such as uh, dimethyl sulfide, hydrogen sulfide. It could be short chain fatty acids, scatols, indoles, volatile amines, and ammonia. So, together, all this gives the odor to your fecal content, and that may vary. Now, so once we said the distension was because of the gas, the second component of the passive distension is because of fluids. Now, why fluids? Because even in the normal circumstances, you have secretion rights from your oral cavity down up to the colon. And if you look at a, a approximate, because remember, these figures are very, very approximate figures. Very, very approximate figures. Why? because saliva can vary from anywhere from 500 even to 1 liter depending upon the condition. But a basal level, approximate basal level, could be saliva about half a liter, stomach 1.2 to 5 liters, and all the rest are given out here. 
Now, small bowel up to three liters. But what we have to understand is that whatever the amount, whatever the amount, the uh, the content, the main content in these is the sodium. So you're basically talking about a sodium rich fluid inside the lumen, right? Right up to the upper small bowel and to the down, down to the colon. Now, the small bowel at any given point of time is bathed by almost nine liters of fluid per day. That means that much amount of fluid is being produced inside the lumen and it is passing through the small bowel. Now, part of it may be absorbed, but in, in a patient who has got obstruction, it didn't, does not get reabsorbed. Why? Because of defective mucosal function. That's why it remains inside the lumen, distending the lumen. Number two, what else happens? There's transference across the capillary membrane because of increased permeability. And why should there be increased permeability? Because of malfunctioning of the endocytes. Now, as a broad division, you can remember that the part above the pylorus and below the pylorus, four liters above and four liters below. But why is this important? Because this helps you in deciding the maintenance fluid or the fluid which is required for replenishing the loss in a patient of acute intestinal obstruction. So four liters above and four liters below the pylorus. Now proximal to the pylorus, you got the swallowed fluid, whatever you eat and drink, plus the saliva, and the gastric juice and distal to the pylorus very obvious is the biliary secretion the pancreatic secretion and the intestinal secretion known as succus entericus which is the small bowel secretion almost up to the tune of three liters that figure gives you the content of sodium potassium chloride and bicarbonate see most of them are isotonic except the part which is lying proximal to the pylorus why is this variable for simple reason it depends upon what kind of food you are having right you have pure water it would be hypotonic. You have a lot of solids, it would be hypotonic. So that is why it is variable. But once it goes beyond the pylorus, the body ensures that whatever is going beyond the pylorus is always an isotonic content. Right? So this was number one. So first thing what happened was that the proximal bowel uh, following an increased parasitic activity has now gone into passive dilatation right the second thing which is happening in the body is dehydration and hypovolemia and of course electrolyte abnormalities and why does this happen for the simple reason that there's vomiting and because of vomiting and obstruction and distension the patient not having anything orally so decrease oral intake and number three more important is the distension of the bowel which is now accommodating a huge amount of fluid which is a massive third space loss now this is the third space loss Whatever is lying inside the lumen, what's lying inside the outside the lumen, in the wall and outside the wall is all third space law. So what is happening? Decreased luminal absorption, so increased luminal content, sequestration to the lumen, bowel wall edema is there, and number three, transudation of fluid may take place into the peritoneal cavity. So all this together leads to a massive third space law. So that is the general alteration in the vascular compartment and the fluid compartment of the body in the form of uh, having a degree uh, having a severe degree of dehydration and possible hypovolemia right now the fluid electrolyte uh, alteration that we just not talked about and the vascular component alteration which are occurring now that would basically depend upon the type and the degree of the block so where is the block whether it's proximal or distal why? Because that will make a difference whether the patient is having predominant vomiting or not. That would be an added feature. So the site of block makes a difference. The duration of block, whether the patient has been having obstruction for the last 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours. The longer the, the persistent obstruction, the more the fluid electrolyte imbalance. And third, it is maximally seen with proximal and small bowel blocks. Proximal basically being what? Proximal to the pylorus and upper uh, small bowel. Why? Because in these cases, vomiting is a predominant presenting feature. So in a proximal obstruction, that's why dehydration hypovolemia is very early to appear. The patient has a low sodium, the patient has low potassium, low chloride, and is usually in alkalosis. Why? For the simple reason that he's losing a lot of acidic gastric content. If you go down the small bowel more distally, there, the vomiting becomes less significant. The vomiting is much less. 
and that is why the patient despite the fact that he is still having hyponatremia and hypokalemia it is not so much clinically significant so the more distal the block the more distal the block the less the degree of fluid electrolyte imbalance as compared to proximal bowel obstruction now the uh, bowel and subsequent bowel distension now what else is happening in the proximal bowel the fluid distension the gaseous distension now what else is happening is that the whole of the bowel is now becoming tense and the whole abdomen now becomes tense now with tenseness of the abdomen the internal pressure increases and with increasing internal pressure now you start having an abdominal compartment syndrome which starts appearing whenever you have a rise of internal pressure beyond 16 millimeters 18 millimeters becomes critical and beyond 20 22 millimeters you start having mercury that is mercury you start having vascular symptomatology because of the compartment syndrome why because that pressure is going to cause pressure over the venous return that means if you have an echeva, so the venous return to the heart is hampered because of the compartment syndrome. So that starts occurring anything beyond 20 millimeters of mercury. So 16 millimeters, alarm bells start ringing, 18 millimeters starts clinical alterations start appearing, and 20 millimeters, you start having critical level of decrease in the uh, vascular uh, or venous return to the heart. Now, third thing. So first we said was the proximal bowel and the associated fluid electrolyte abnormality number three what happens to the distal bowel now initially it is a very common history when the patients come to you with a bloated abdomen everything and you take a history of the patient he says i've been passing stool and flatter but that is less in amount as compared to normal why does that happen that basically happening because the distal segment that means distal to the site of block still has the fecal content in it has some air in it so less of flatters but some amount of fecal content will still be, be uh, being passed by the patient despite the onset of obstruction and this could even be manifesting as a diarrhea so until it is emptied once the distal segment empties itself then there is total obstipation the fourth thing which is occurring in these patients is uh, a possible sepsis that would again depend upon the type of block and would also depend upon the site of block now what about sepsis if you look at the normal small bubble flora it is in the region of 10 to the power 3 10 to the power 5 colony forming units per ml of bacteria that is the normal uh, concentration in which the bacterial content is expressed right in an obstructed bowel this 10 to the power 3 10 to the power 5 changes immediately to 10 to the power 9 10 to the power 10 colony forming units of per ml that basically means what it tells you there will be multiplication of both aerobic and anaerobic bacteria and the increased concentration of these bacteria number two even a qualitative change now starts appearing in what form that now the predominant bacteria in an obstructed bowel are usually the gram negative e coli the klebsiella and the gram positive streptococcus fecalis they predominant these are three which predominant right enterococci as a group which includes e coli and klebsiella they are basically the predominant number three the luminal bacteria because of increased concentration and because of decreased function of the mucosa now they are able to translocate into the mesenteric lymph nodes once they reach the mesenteric lymph nodes that reaches it leads to a local inflammatory response in the gut and the mesentery there's amplification of the inflammatory response that inflammatory response again leads to increase in the sepsis and there is increased fluid leakage into the lumen and peritoneal cavity that basically means increased third space losses and that sets up what a systemic sepsis and ultimately multiple organ failure or multiple organ dysfunction syndrome so mods or mof would be the result of this ongoing process of sepsis the pathophysiology another thing which could be happening in these patients with obstruction which have been uh, there for a prolonged period could be strangulation now this strangulation is basically what it is a venous compromise to start with leading to capillary hypertension resulting in sequestration of the lumen why because the venous return is blocked so what happens the artery is still pumping so there's increased flow into the capillary so capillary hypertension when there's hypertension it is going to drive the fluid out why because hydrostatic pressure inside the capillary has risen so sequestration to the lumen once that happens 
and it reaches a critical level, then the arterial compromise starts occurring. Why? Because the artery has to pump more and more blood against the increasing pressure inside the capillary. Ischemic infarction would now occur. Why? Because once the arterial inflow starts suffering, ischemic infarction can easily occur. An ultimate result is, of course, gangrene. Loss of functional mucosal layer appears very early once there is venous compromise, and that leads to what? Bacterial translocation, increased permeability, and toxins can be moved from lumen into the peritoneal cavity. Right? The strangulation in a simple case of obstruction could be because of increased distension, and that distension leads to pressure on the wall and ischemia. It could also be because of external bands, like, for example, in hernia or hernial orifices or uh, additions. It could be interrupted blood flow because of valvulus interception, where there's an actual twist leading to a venous compromise because of external pressure over the vein, or because of increased internal pressure, like, for example, in a closed loop obstruction, we'll tell you what it is. And primarily, it could be mesenteric infarction, meaning thereby that there has been a primary block of thrombosis in the superior mesenteric artery or the inferior mesenteric artery or the celiac axis, the parts which are supplying. These are three axes supplying the whole of the GI, celiac, and you've got the superior mesenteric and the inferior mesenteric, right? So any of these could lead to strangulation. Now, we just now said closed loop obstruction. So what really is the closed loop obstruction? Closed loop obstruction basically means that there is block involving both the afferent and the efferent, and in between you have a closed loop. So this forms the closed loop. There's the afferent limb, the efferent limb, and there's the closed loop. Now with passive time, see what is happening. There is congestion. See the volume has increased. The bowel has distended. Now initially, both the afferent and the efferent segments are collapsed. But later on, what is happening because of obstruction, the afferent segment will now start undergoing distension, right? Another method of having closed obstruction could be a patent or a functioning or a competent allocecal wall along with a block in the colon. Like for example, ascending colon or descending colon. So there's a block here, and because there's a competent IC wall, there's a block here, right? Now this will lead to what? A, a closed loop obstruction. That's another method of having closed obstruction. So ascending colon blocks with a patent IC wall, a uh, volvulus, sigmoid, sequel, or more commonly a small bowel volvulus, they are all instances where you have a closed loop obstruction. So, what is basically happening? The pathophysiology I said earlier, you have block at both the limbs, increase interlumbar pressure. This pressure leads to venous and the whole uh, scenario of strangulation, which just not talked about. And there is uh, ischemia, necrosis, and very early perforation in these closed loop obstructions, right? Now, what are the clinical features of a dynamic intestinal obstruction? This is a generalized presentation would weigh upon what? The site of obstruction, whether it is, let's say, proximal to the pylorus, if the patient will having purely gastric vomiting, or the, it is having upper small bowel, the patient will having biliopancreatic vomiting. So, presentation will vary depending upon the site, the duration for which it has been there, the degree, whether it is a partial or total, the causative pathology, and with or without ischemia, that basically means whether there is strangulation or there has been a vascular compromise otherwise, like, for example, a mesenteric infarction. The presentation feature, typical number one, is pain. Pain is a presenting feature, and the character of the pain to start with, initially it's colicky, later becomes dull, persistent pain of distension, and later on it may actually disappear once there is paralysis or ileus or paralytic ileus. Now, the site of pain would also vary. If it is small bowel pathology, it would be a periumbilical presentation of pain. If it is a large bowel obstruction, it would be a pain in the flanks. The second cardinal feature of an acute cell obstruction is vomiting. And vomiting would, would basically be, uh, can be discussed under number one, the time frame, and number two, the pattern and content. Now, the time frame basically means when is the vomiting going to appear? from the onset of acute cell obstruction. So if it is uh, high, small bowel, or proximal obstruction, it is a very early presenting feature. And if it is a complete obstruction, it is a very early presenting feature. It would be a late vomiting in a patient having distal small bowel, large bowel, or a partial bowel obstruction. So see, the time frame would vary. What kind of obstruction you have, and where do you have, whether it's complete, incomplete, or whether it's small bowel or large bowel. 
what would be the pattern and contents? The pattern and contents will basically depend upon again the site. So if you have a high small bowel obstruction, obviously you'll be having initially a projectile gastric and then followed by bilious, right? That would be the scenario. But once it persists, and as I said earlier, the peristaltic activity gradually ceases, then it becomes a regurgitant feculent. Why? Because the pylorus now becomes incompetent, the whole of the small bowel is dilated, and now the patient starts vomiting what? Feculent content. So even in a high small bowel obstruction, you can have a regurgitant feculent vomiting if the obstruction has been there for a prolonged period of time. If it is a distal small bowel block or it is a large bowel obstruction, then the vomiting is always late, regurgitant, and feculent. So see, the difference is the projectile and regurgitant. And in high small bowel, initially gastric and biliary content followed by feculent. And in a distal small bowel or a large bowel, to start with, it is always a feculent vomiting. The third cardinal feature is distension. So first we said pain. Number two, we just now told you that it is basically vomiting. And number three is distension. Now, distension again would depend upon the site of block. Like, for example, if it is a proximal small bowel, the distension is very, very mild. But as you go down the small bowel and more of the proximal bowel is involved in distension, then obviously there would be a early central distension, visible small bowel loops like and with visible peristalsis like a ladder pattern. So you'll find those uh, uh, transverse loops lying transversely, small bowel loops transversely across the abdomen in a ladder fashion or step ladder fashion. And the, the very peristalsis, the initial stages would be visible. If it's a large bowel obstruction, the distension is very early as opposed to a small bowel. It is earlier in large bowel. Number two, pronounced and always in the flanks. So it starts in the flank. So as compared to small bowel, large bowel distension appears earlier. Distal small bowel slightly later and proximal small bowel even later. Now, when in a large bowel obstruction, when the ileocecal wall becomes incompetent, so initially what is happening? The ileocecal wall is competent. But in passive time, because of increased distension, the wall becomes incompetent. And when that happens, the flank which were distended now convert into flank and central distension. Why? Because the small bowel now starts getting distended. So remember, that is the pattern of distension which can tell you what kind of obstruction is the patient having, whether it's large bowel or small bowel. What about the bowel sounds? Now, to start with, a normal bowel sound pattern, if you put a set scope on the abdomen, and for how much time should you put the set scope? For one minute? No. It should at least be for three to four minutes. And what should you find? You should find at least three to four uh, sounds, bowel sounds per minute. So do not just put it for a minute and say that this is absent. That is not right. It should be at least for three to four minutes, preferably five minutes. You keep your uh, auscultating the abdomen around the umbilical, that is peri-umbilical region, and you should be able to hear three to four bowel sounds per minute. Initially, in an obstructive pattern, it is always much more. You can almost have a continuous bowel sound. It may be as much as that, depending on the personality activity. But later on, when the bowel starts distending, that sound changes to a tinkling sound, as if water is falling into a receptacle, which is a dilated bowel. So it is a tinkling sound. And still later, you'll have a silent abdomen. That means you've kept your cystoscope even for four minutes or five minutes, and still you're not able to perceive or hear any bowel sound. The fourth cardinal feature of obstruction is obstipation. So remember, pain, we started with pain, then we had the vomiting, we had distension, and then we have obstipation, which is another term for absolute constipation, which is another term for no flatus, no feces. Constipation, no feces, no flatus, no feces, absolute constipation, constipation, or obstipation. Now, there are exceptions to this, and the exceptions to, the, to this uh, obstipation, number one, the initial fecal content, which is being passed for 24 to 48 hours, which we just not alluded to because the distal content, uh, distal bowel having that content. So distal segment still having the fecal content, the patient can keep on passing PC for 24 to 48 hours. Or the patient has got a partial bowel obstruction. He'll keep on passing flatter than feces, but 
much less than the his normal whatever his normal was it is much less uh, less than his normal number two richter's hernia which is basically a hernia which is involving only one uh, wall of the bowel that is endomesentric border the mesentric border is not involved so that means the lumen is never totally blocked so in richter's hernia again you still be having a uh, passive platelets and pcs in a gallstone ileus you will still be having passive platelets and pcs or a mesentric vascular insult because there is no luminal block it is only a neurogenic block you can still have passive platelet and PC. So these are the exceptions to the obstipation, right? Now, the clinical features. So now we know basically the important clinical features, which were the cardinal features. Now, what else is happening inside the body? So we had those four cardinal features, which tells you that probably, yes, these, this patient is having a uh, obstruction. What else is happening in this patient? Remember in pathophysiology, we said, so this patient will be showing all signs, symptoms of hyponatremia, and hypokalemia in the form of severe dehydration and uh, a patient having hypovolemia in the form of uh, rapid thready pulse the tachycardia will be there the pulse volume will be much less than normal or it may actually be an absence of the peripheral pulses cold and clammy skin so all these are featured dehydration and severe hypovolemia super added on that could be feature of septicemia if there has been strangulation and translocation of bacteria into the into the uh, vascular compartment either the translocation to the peritoneal cavity or the lymphatics or the vascular compartment wherever so these bacteria actually are absorbed from where from the lumen so the patient may show signs of septicemia along with that what else do you find in the abdomen now normally a patient having a some obstruction the abdomen is not usually tender not usually tender it is distended and even that the tenderness is a tenderness of distension because the the whole of the abdominal cavity has been stretched out so that is the tenderness but if the patient has got strangulation the patient has got peritonitis or the patient has got an inflammatory cause obstruction then he would be having specific areas of increased tenderness and rigidity but if the patient has got a generalized distension the tendons and rigidity are usually not perceivable but if the patient has got strangulation peritonitis, inflammatory uh, reason for giving some obstruction this patient could be having tenderness and rigidity now how are you going to diagnose now this is just basically a general acute cell obstruction we are not talking about the specific cause we'll come to that later so you have a patient in front of you against cell obstruction so what do you do the first thing you will always order is a plain skygram of the abdomen in the erect or the lying portion depending upon the condition of the patient the patient is is uh, moribund almost moribund not able stand up take a skygram in the lying portion now a plain skygram of the abdomen ap view remember ap view axr ap view 50 to 92 percent sensitivity for diagnosing small bowel obstruction now the figure is so variable see it's almost twice 50 and twice is 100 so it's almost twice 50 to 92 percent sensitivity so that's a very very variable sensitivity you can say it is not absolutely diagnostic so lying posture is usually preferable <coughs> unless you're looking for gas under the dome of the diaphragm when you have to take a standing posture or you have other lateral views which we were talking about when we talk about peritonitis if not then we'll be talking about those now what are you looking for you're looking for fluid levels now normal fluid levels that you have in an abdomen in an adult are two one is always the gastric fundus and number two is in the region of the ileus cecal. There could be a third in the region of the duodenum or one in the small bowel. So usual is two, but in infants, there are a few more, and these are periumbilical in the small bowel. When you have a small bowel obstruction, so that was the normal. In a small bowel obstruction, you're having multiple fluid levels, and depending upon the part of the bowel which is involved, it could either be centrally placed if it is small bowel obstruction, if it is a large bowel obstruction peripheral fluid levels are usually seen and they can also be seen without obstruction remember that is very important that if you have fluid level don't go ahead and say this patient has to have acute cell obstruction why because that has to be correlated with the clinical history why for the simple reason that you can have fluid levels in paralytic ileus as a result of certain acute conditions like for example acute pancreatitis or any other reason for paralytic ileus gastroenteritis abdominal sepsis so there's no true obstruction there. It is not a mechanical obstruction. That's a dynamic. So you can still have fluid levels in these patients. Distended loops are also seen. And where do you see the distended loops? Either in the, the flanks or you see it in the central part of the bowel. 
What else are you seeing in the descending loop? You're looking for the evaluably conventus, which are their characteristic in the proximal small bowel. As you go down the small bowel into the into the ileum, then they start disappearing. And what are these? These are basically regularly spaced and extending from margin to margin, which are basically seen because of mucosal edema, right? And they are always there in horizontal ladder-like pattern. In the colon, you have hostrations, which are never complete. They're incomplete folds. So you'll never get this complete circular appearance. And uh, they're irregularly spaced as opposed to valvular conventus, which are very regularly spaced. The third thing you're looking for is the bowel diameter, which is very important. The small bowel diameter, if it is more than three centimeters at three sites, then it's small bowel obstruction. What about colonic obstruction? six centimeters or more for colon and if it is cecum more than nine centimeters is a critical distension so these are critical distinctions that basically tells you that this is the time when you should be able to diagnose and treat as early as possible why because the next thing is going to happen is perforation because of ischemia over distension leads to what ischemia ischemia leads to what perforation so small bowel remember three colon six cecum nine three six nine remember that that formula is very simple, small bowel 3, colon 9, uh, colon 6, and cecum upper limit is 9. So that can easily be measured on a plain skygraph. Now, this is basically, you can see, can you see these valvular conventus? The complete regular, the regular folds. See the regular folds, the small bowel. And see the step ladder pattern? The step ladder pattern, you're climbing up the ladder, that's the step ladder pattern. Now, here you can see the air fluid level it is this so this is the distended bowel hardly any fluid level but here you can see the fluid levels can you see the fluid level transversely appearing this is the fluid level that is not the fluid level this is the fluid level this is not a fluid level this is distended bowel but these horizontal are the fluid levels very clearly seen out here so this small bowel and then you have the large bowel fluid levels the, basically signified by the larger diameter out here and fluid level so fluid level basically nothing but fluid and on top of that you have the gas so this is the fluid and the gas so that is the fluid level that we're talking about so that gives you a clear picture that you have now in patients of uh, obstruction you can also have a ground glass appearance or a gasless abdomen and that is basically when the small bowel and that is if there's a nasogastric tube placement the whole of the bowel is collapsed so you can have a ground glass pattern that's number one number two if the patient has peritonitis along with gives obstruction there's fluid inside the abdomen you can again have a gasless abdomen or a ground glass pattern another finding which you can find is a string of bead sign where small pockets of gas within a fluid filled small bowel so you have gas then no gas gas no gas no gas no gas just like the beads beads in uh, which are seen on a string. Now, the second investigation would be a water-soluble contrast study. And what are you using? Number one, oral contrast or a enema contrast. Now, oral contrast is the usual method of small bowel obstruction. And what are you giving? You're giving usually gastrographin or thin barium. Remember that. 50 to 100 ml of contrast, which could be very, very thin barium or preferably gastrographin, which is now preferred through a oral route ask the patient to drink it or push it in through a nasogastric tube. Now, as early as 30 to 60 minutes, you may be able to see the colon, but nevertheless, you should be looking for the colon up to 24 hours. So average four to 24 hours is time, up to which time, if it doesn't appear in the colon, you can say that, yes, this patient has got obstruction because the oral contrast has not still appeared inside the colon. The sensitivity is 96%, and the specificity is 98% for oral contrast study. The disadvantages are there. One, that if the contrast has been given and stays for a longer period of time in small bowel, it becomes so dilute that when the, by the time it reaches the colon, it is no longer radiopaque. So the transition point before the scan occurs because, because there is a dilution of the contrast that you're given, right? And it may obscure the evaluation of small bowel wall, which you would like to see for the edema or the thinning of the wall, which is a very important sign for any kind of vascular compromise. So that limits the, the evaluation of bowel ischemia. The second method of giving a contrast 
is a contrast enema and that is a method usually reserved for differentiating it from a pseudo obstruction where whole of the lumen is patent in a mechanical obstruction there has to be a luminal block the third method is the ultrasound it is still one of the methods got its place it is not the investigation of choice remember see what's written the cct with the ccd that is with the oral contrast is the gold standard the abnormal ultrasound is not the gold standard but it gives you a number of suggestive findings which can tell you and that's why the accuracy if you uh, if the, a good ultrasonologist can give you an accuracy of as high as 89 uh, percent for diagnosis cell obstruction it's not a small figure that's a very big figure <clears throat> but still the gold standard is ccd with oral contrast and that is the the advantage of ccd number it tells you the distension it tells you the site it tells you the cause is giving you a complete picture of the obstruction most of the cases it's also telling you about the ischemic injury in the form of uh, decreased uh, bowel thickness and if you find a reduced bowel wall ischemia that is 11 times more chance of having a, a strangulation right if there's an absent mesenteric edema so you're looking for mesenteric edema and the wall edema so if there is ischemia of the wall 11 times chance of having strangulation mesenteric edema is absent six times less chances of strangulation what about mri does it have a role normally no unless until where there is a ct contraindication or a contrast dye that the patient is being given the patient is allergic to the dye so in these instances an mri can be substituted for uh, for the ccd but otherwise mri as such does not have a role in pure cell obstruction but one of the other investigation is now uh, coming into four is the diagnostic laparoscopy wherever possible why did i use the word wherever possible for the simple reason for putting in a laparoscope you have to have a space at the peritoneal cavity if the whole of the abdomen is so distended you can't put in a laparoscope so diagnostic laparoscopy has got a limited role in upper gi obstruction never in lower gi obstruction and large bowel obstruction where the distension precludes the putting in of the port side general principles of management or general principle of management number one nasal acid decompression and drainage both for decompressing by uh, uh, by uh, removing what is lying inside the stomach and of course keep on draining whatever is being produced inside the stomach number two fluid electrolyte management is very important and when you're looking at the fluid electrolyte management you have to look at the volume and number two you have to look at the the type of fluid that you want to give now volume it must include what the losses and which losses which is very obvious which the patient uh, the which is very evident like for example the nasogastric the rile tube suction whatever is there inside the rile tube uh, aspirate the volume of aspirate number two the amount of urine that the patient found in the last 24 hours so these are the two important parameters plus abnormal losses like example the patient is febrile you've talked about that if you know not you must be knowing from a knowledge of shock that uh, the the degree of uh, the degree of fever or hyperparaxia has to be taken account beyond 37 degrees centigrade. The more the fever, the more the allowance for uh, fluid loss because of sweating. So the losses which are obvious and abnormal losses. Number two, like for example, patient got tracheostomy. Now that tracheostomy loses a lot of fluid to the to the uh, respiratory compartment, and that's why you tend to keep a wet gauze piece over the tracheostomy. Tra tra so these are abnormal losses, but the normal loss should always be taken into account and you have to add the maintenance fluid that is required for 24 hours you have to add the both both of them only then you come to the total volume required what about the qualitative two things have to be kept in mind in the early stages number one sodium number two potassium both of them are important and you have to be on the lookout for hyponatremia and hypokalemia and that is why one of the best solutions to start replenishment or start a managing a fluid electrolyte imbalance in a patient against cell obstruction is always the Hartman solution and non and not normal saline. Remember, normal saline initially there was a toss-up between Hartman's and normal saline. You could have picked either of the two, but no longer so. Normal saline is not the uh, uh, the fluid of choice in early stages unless you know, the patient got a specific uh, indication of normal saline. But to start any uh, replenishment, it is the Hartman solution, also known as Ringer's lactate solution, which is the preferred solution to start the replenishment in a patient against cell obstruction. Now, whenever you carry out a treatment, 
the treatment of cause is important now these are just general principles we talk about specific treatment we talk about the specific cause of obstruction but you have to be on the lookout whenever you're treating a patient with cell obstruction you have should have be concerned about what the duration of your cell obstruction the patient may have come to you after three days of history or the patient will come to you uh, last night i had this acute pain my everyone is now getting distended i'm vomiting so that patient has come to you early so the time of duration from the onset of against obstruction that has a very important bearing because that will give you the amount of fluid and electrolyte loss number two the chance of strangulation where there chance of strangulation the patient not if there are you have to go in and uh, you have to treat this patient as early as possible so there are clinical signs of strangulation which you talked about a tender abdomen uh, a rising tachycardia a parade as early as possible other complications which are possible like for example sepsis perforation this patient is likely to have what likely to have sepsis and perforation so i should operate on this patient early adequate exposure when you opening the abdomen an adequate exposure is a must you cannot have any kind of mini unless certainly you got a specific diagnosis pre operatively you cannot cannot have any kind of mini uh, approaches to uh, acute cell obstruction it has to be adequate exposure so that you can elicit the cause and you can treat the site early decompression because the whole of the bowel is so deep uh, distended that you try to move it out of the operating field it comes back so a good method could be that decompress that bowel early and once you decompress you have enough space inside the abdomen and when you decompress the bowel or you brought the bowel out of the abdomen always judge the viability of the bowel always judge the viability of the bowel so these are the important points which have to be taken into account whenever we're talking about the general principles of management now just a few special types uh, we want to talk about all of them we'll do uh, another lecture for that but just the important ones number one is a stricture these are the mechanical obstruction called stricture formation and the cause of stricture this is how it appears the proximal limb and this is the distal limb so the causes common could be tubercular the post operative stricture you have done an anastomosis and anastomosis so tight that post operatively that became a constriction ring or the patient having Crohn's disease, a post ischemic insult, or malignancy. Any of these could be given as a stricture, and they would present as either subacute cell obstruction or acute cell obstruction. In a subacute cell obstruction, the difference in acute cell obstruction is simple: that the degree of presentation, presenting features, is much less as compared to acute cell obstruction. That means the four cardinal features of pain: the pain is persistent. This pain never disappears. In acute cell obstruction, we said it became more and more until it disappeared. Why? Because paralytic island. In SAIO, paralytic island doesn't occur. So that pain would be persistent. The vomiting would be present there. And the distension may or may not be there, either partial or more. But the history of gola formation is always there. That means the patient can feel something moving inside the abdomen. And it is never obstipation. It is always constipation and paucity of flat. That means less of platter and paucity of stools, right? So either a subacute cell obstruction or AIO. The treatment is simple, and the treatment is that you give a transfer incision across <coughs> and close it, create a diamond opening and close it transversely. So along the long axis of the stricture and close it transversely at right angles. That is a simple stricturoplasty that often suffices. But if that doesn't suffice, like example, in a patient of Crohn's disease, structural is usually not possible. Then why? Because the long segment involved. So if the structure is narrow, you can do a structural plasty. If the structure is broad, then you have to go in for resection anastomosis. That means that part of the valve uh, has to be removed and anastomosis. The second is a bolus obstruction and the causes. Bolus basically now we talk about a luminal obstruction. Now what can obstruct the lumen? The rare conditions, gallstones, usually seen in elderly patients. And how do the gallstone reach the, the bowel? Is it passing through the CBD into ampullator, into the duodenum? No, never. A stone is uh, large enough to cause obstruction, can never negotiate the CBD and the ampullator. For having a gallstone ileus, it has to be a very large stone. And that means it has to have an alternate route of moving to the intestine. And that alternate route is always erosion of the gallbladder wall into the duodenum. So what you're having is a duodenal uh, uh, cholecystic fistula or cholecystic fistula where the gallbladder wall and the duodenum 
have crystallized, crystallized and the gallbladder stone has moved into the duodenum from there it goes and where does it impact very commonly it is a very specific site and that is at 60 centimeters proximal to the ic wall because that is the site from where the jejunum starts narrowing into the ileum so usually 60 centimeters proximal to the ic wall you'll find that gallstone stuck and giving rise to gallstone ileum the typical presentation is a rigorous triad and what is that triad number one small bowel obstruction pneumobilia that means air inside the biliary channels from where is the air coming from the duodenum into the into the uh, gallbladder into the extra hepatic biliary channels and the intrahepatic biliary channels and atypical radiopaque shadow on axr so three important features of diagnosis of gallstone ileus that is known as the rigorous triad two of these is pathognomic and it is found in 40 50 percent of patients and ultrasound is almost uh, is is very helpful in these patients where you can see or you can diagnose uh, a stone inside the gallbladder you can also see the air inside the biliary channel and on top of that you have the obstruction then be sure that this patient could possibly be having a uh, acute cell obstruction now presentation can either be as a saio where you have the ball wall effect which is similar to the fluctuating jaundice in a cbd stone remember in a cbd stone what happened the stone is impacted inside the cbd when it's impacted there's a proximal buildup of the bile the proximal build of the bile now start distending the wall when the walls start distending the wall move away from the impacted stone so now the fluid starts trickling by the side of the stone and goes under the stone and lifts it up that is the ball wall effect of a cbd stone similarly here also you have a ball wall effect of the gallstone leading to a presentation of saio because of a gallstone ileum or if it is terribly impact then the patient will present with aio treatment is very simple you crush that stone from outside and then milk a display you don't have to open the the bowel but if at all you're not able to it's a hard stone not able to do it and in crushing you're liable to damage the bowel then you have to go in for entrotomy create an opening over the stone remove the stone and you close the opening the second method of uh, luminal obstruction could be bezoars which are basically luminal contents thick luminal contents it could either be a trico bezoar or it could be a food and phyto bezoar now now this uh, trico bezoars could be a hairball, which is the most common, usually seen in psychiatric patients eating hair, very common in the pubertal age group in females, presenting with lump in the epigastrium and pain. The diagnosis is very easily made on CCT or even ultrasound, and the treatment is simple. Do a gastrotomy and remove it, uh, remove it and then close the gastrotomy. It could be a phytobizarre, it will, because of high fiber content you have a thick intake inadequate chewing you tend to gulp with uh, food without chewing the whole bolus goes in and with the passive time that usually consolidates and give rise to a phytobiziol post gastrectomy or gastrogenosomy in these cases why because the milling effect of the of the pylorus is no longer there the milling effect of the pylorus is very very important in reducing your food from the solid content into a semi-solid content which can easily be negotiated throughout the bowel if it is semi-solid you'll never have a phytobezoar so in those patients where the milling effect is absent like example the pyrus is no longer there you've done a gastrectomy or you've done a partial gastrectomy you have removed the pylorus or you've done a gastrogenosomy where the food doesn't need to go to the pylorus from the stomach goes directly to the jejunum so in either of these cases you can have increased incidence of phytobezoars the treatment is milk it distally. If not, then again, entrotomy can be done. The fourth thing which can block it could be stercolith, also known as coprolith or fecolith. And what does it contain? Hard, stony mass of feces in the intestinal tract in association with stricture, usually seen with stricture. You have a stricture, proximal to it, gradually build up of thick, thick, thick material until it assumes a stony uh, mass appearance. And that is known as stercolith. It can obstruct, it can even obstruct the lumen of the bowel. It can also obstruct the appendix, leading to appendicitis. It can also obstruct it diverticulate, leading to verticulitis. So it, the, the stercolith is not only uh, responsible for small bowel obstruction, it can also be responsible for appendicitis and diverticulitis.
The treatment is the treatment of manifestation, right? The other cause for bolus obstruction is worms. And among the worms, you've got the Ascariasis and Lumbrocoridus, which is the most common and usually presenting with SBO or AIO. That means either small bubble obstruction or complete or partial obstruction. Now, these are those where the whole bowel is laden with hundreds of Ascariasis. And that is usually seen either in children or elderly. That means extreme surface. And a very common history is I was given uh, anti worm therapy, anti helminthic therapy, and subsequent to that, within 20 to 48 hours, it present, patient presents with obstruction. Why does that happen? Because until the worm are alive, they keep moving. They keep moving. But once you kill them, they become a hard mass. So it is usually precipitated after a huge dose of anti helminthic, where the load of these, of these uh, ascariasis is huge in the bowel. Pre operative diagnosis is very, very difficult. CCT may help you try uh, treatment again, just like crushing in a stone. Here you try to knead the contents forward, may or may not be possible into the colon, may or may not be possible. If not possible, go ahead and do a entrotomy. And coming to the last part of today's lecture, and that is the bands. We will not be talking about adhesions today, adhesion next time, but we'll talk about the bands. Now, the bands could be either inflammatory, congenital, which could be a little distal duct or it could be a greater omitral edition. Inflammatory bands are very common because of, uh, I wouldn't say very common, but an uh, uh, important reason for any of the inflammatory bowel condition can give rise to an inflammatory band. Congenital, we said, vitreoidesinal duct, or other congenital bands, right? That was our ligament of teeth or lats band, just not talked about that, and greater omental additions. Congenital bands are important, 3% of all intestinal obstruction, that's a sizable population. 3% of all intestinal obstruction are with congenital bands. Almost always obstruct the small intestine. So remember, bands are usually causative of small bowel obstruction, hardly ever for the large bowel obstruction. And what are these? Number one, the lats band, which is across the ascending corner to the ileum, ligament of teeth, right, right lobe of liver to the ileum, right lower liver to the ascending colon, and of course the lats band, right? So these are the usual bands. The ligament of teeth, if you see this figure, it is suspending the duodenojejunal junction. That's the lats band for you, right? And where is it arising from? It is arising from the transverse process of the L2 vertebrae, right? The right crust. See, this is the right crust of the diaphragm. This is the left crust from where the esophagus comes. That's the esophagus and stomach. It has been pushed up or uh, it has been flipped up. I'll use the word flipped up. So you see the posterior wall of the stomach, that the esophagus. And here you see the esophageal apertures, the right crust and the left crust. From here, this band is negotiating where across the stem of the celiac trunk. See the celiac trunk, this cuts of it, the celiac axis. And you have got the superior mesenteric artery rising from there. And you've got the lymph nodes out there, right? And from there, so it's arising from the right crust. And from the right crust, it is hinging the duodeno-jejunal angle. That is the ligament of teeth. And here, it is continuous with the muscles of the duodenum. So that's the last band for you. Uh, sorry, uh, that's the ligament of teeth for you. That's not the last band. Then you come to the bands of lats. Now, here what could happen is that if you have a tight, if you have a tight ligament, then there could be angulation at the duodeno-jejunal junction leading to duodeno jejunal obstruction, which can appear not only in the younger age group, it can also appear in later age group. Now, here is a band of lat. What is the band of lat? This is basically from the parietal peritoneum from the wall. So this is the flank and from there up to the ascending colon. Now, in this process, it is obstructing the duodenum third part or the proximal small bowel. Now, when could this happen? See this figure. Is this a normal orientation of the large bowel? No. The ascending colon should have been here. The transfers colon here. So this is a mal rotation. So bands of lad are usually seen in incomplete rotation of the bowel passing from the infrahepatic parietal peritoneum. So this is the area of the infra, infra, uh, infrahepatic. The liver would be here. So infrahepatic parietal peritoneum and going to the mal rotated ascending colon. Compressing what? The junction of the third and the second part of the duodenum characteristically. So that means it is at the turn of the C, the lower turn of the C. And just slitting the band is curative, right? 
thank you for your time i think we'll finish out here and uh, next time we'll talk about the additions which is a very important cause for obstruction if you have any questions always direct them to me thank you for your time